Uh, quite possibly.
Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Who here is hating the sunshine? Good. It's nice to see it. It is nice to be able to drive and need to put down the blinders or the whatever you call that thing. <laughs> Visor, thank you. Don't put the blinders on while you're driving. Good idea. Uh, I'll eventually figure it all out. It is, uh, yes, it is encouraging that spring is around the corner, that the interesting weather that we have all in one day will some smooth itself out. I think we had sleet, snow, wind. There was, a th there was thunder at one point in time. I was like, well. Wow. We had a thunderstorm one night. Yeah. So it is the joys of Canada. It is the joys of of creation and all the different things that go along with it. So as we gather this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, I welcome you. Uh, there are a few announcements. Uh, this week is a busy week. This is Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday. Uh, there is the Lenten service being held at Arthur United Church on April 5th. Uh, the theme is uh, Renewed and looking at the woman at the well. Uh, there's the Good Friday cantata. The practice is uh, today, last practice, and it'll be uh, the good uh, the cantata will be happening on Good Friday at Grace Anglican Church at 7:30 p.m. Uh, Thursday, we're just jumping all over the week. <laughs> Uh, we have the Monday Thursday service at, in Arthur. It's just a service. It's not a potluck. Uh, Friday morning is a Good Friday service here at 10 a.m. Um, we will be handing out to take home yes. cross, hot cross buns and, and jam. jam. Don't forget about the jam. The jam is very important. Um, and coming up later in April is coffee hour. Uh, the information is there, and then also uh, there's a concert at Knox Alora Presbyterian Church, and the information is there for for your perusal. And then there's the uh, St. Andrews and Alma's having 
Uh, the Butter Tart Festival, which I believe some of the uh, people from the congregation will be making butter tarts and selling them. And they decided to put it from 11 a.m. until sold out because well, they sold out fairly quickly. They, well, and it's, it says 11 a.m., but they were letting people buy like, shortly after 10, so we were pretty well sold out before we met our goals. So get there early if you're coming. Yes. So those are the announcements. I invite us to join together for our Palm Sunday reading. I believe Sonia, if you're up to it. Your name's in the bulletin, so it's like, I thought you did it last week. Just as the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, the Spirit sends us into places of uncertainty where we confront our weakness and insecurities. Sometimes the wilderness is the city. In the city, life can be a struggle where the vulnerable are victimized by unfamiliar structures. Jesus rode into Jerusalem to reclaim the city for God. By entering on a donkey, Jesus showed that he would rule with humility and compassion. We remember that many are lost and alone. Refugees, the unhoused, sex workers, those far from home. We cannot put the burden on the destitute to find their way through the urban maze. We come in humility to serve those whose resources are few and whose needs are many. Amen. I invite us to join together as we sing, O Glory, Laud, and Honor. Please stand.
the intricacies of plants and animals, of bugs and birds, of water and fish, that all work together, that all help to produce life, to produce the air that we breathe, the food that we need. Lord, as we come into your holy, holy presence, we're astounded by the great love that you have shown us, that you have come in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, to reconcile us to yourself, to know the fullness of your grace and your mercy, to see your loving hand welcoming us, inviting us in, helping us to grow, to flourish in the life that you have blessed us with, that you wash us with your grace, that we might be filled with your love, that we might be a, that our sins might be washed away, and the bondage of sin, the wages of sin, might be lost forever. Lord, help us, for we do not always acknowledge your existence. Forgive us, Lord, for the busyness that we have put into our lives, not a busyness of doing what you have called us to do, but a busyness of doing everything but, of doing the things that others have said we must, the things that we think we should, and yet too often we forget about caring for those who need to be cared for, about taking time to come before you in rest and renewal, about taking the time to help, to allow your love to be seen and felt. Help us, Lord. Help us to reorder our lives, that we would not sin against you and against others, but that we allow the fullness of your grace and your love to be seen and felt throughout all the world. Lord, help us. Help us to discern what is from you and what is just filling our lives and tiring us out. We pray this in Jesus' name. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The mission moment this morning comes from PWS and D. It's entitled, In the Words of a Teenage Entrepreneur. Aslan Polyas lives in Haiti, a country which experiences some of the world's highest levels of food insecurity caused by climate change and civil unrest. One day, Aslan decided to go and see what other kids her age were doing at a youth club in her community. Intrigued by their activities, Aslan decided to join the club. The youth club, run by PWSD's partner in Haiti, with support from Canadian Food Grains Bank, helps young people develop skills for growing food crops that are more resilient in the face of increasingly unpredictable climate patterns. From the club, I learned a lot of things, like how to plant my own garden and use natural resource management. After receiving some training in the club's demonstration garden, I decided to start my own kitchen garden, where I planted okra, peppers, tomatoes, jute leaves, eggplant, and spinach, shares Osling. Today, Osling's garden is fruitful. Not only does she earn an income from it, but her garden also provides healthy food for her family and, in, and inspiration to her community. This Latin season, let us help support projects that provide sustainable solution to address food insecurity and climate change. I invite us to join together once again in song as we sing Hosanna. Please stand. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. 
Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, my God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Lord, we lift up your name. With hearts full of praise, be exalted, O Lord my God, glory to the King of kings. We lift up your name, with hearts full of praise, be exalted, O Lord my God. It's time for our Sunday School time and the fairly popular game, Finish That Lyric. Alrighty. The first one's an easy one, I hope. Bala, black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir. I think we got it. <laughs> now it's interesting. You guys were like right in tune with that one, but Bob Bob Black Sheep, we're a little bit out. <laughs> All right, I did hear something about uh, some Elvis people who enjoy Elvis's music. <laughs> Yeah, this one's a new one to me, actually. Alrighty, so just going along with the flow. No time to stop and say hello. And a little white whale on the go. Riding high above the undertow. Just going along with the flow. Just going along with the flow, you said? Yeah. We got a vote for A. No B, no time to stop and say hello. I'm gonna say C. C, and a little white whale on the go. And D, riding high above the undertow. So I've got at least a vote for A, two votes for C. Let's see. This is the hardest one so far. Are you cheating? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if you're trying to call a friend. Alrighty. <laughs> Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening me. Anyways, you haven't heard this one. 
I'm sure you heard it at some point in time. <laughs> okay, so Queen Bohemian Rhapsody. Very nicely. be a good theme as we're celebrating Palm Sunday as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a white on a young colt a symbol of humility but also a symbol of peace and kingship let us watch the video one day Jesus was with his disciples in a place called the Mount of Olives he gave two of his disciples a special job while they were there. He said, go to the village ahead of us. As soon as you get there, you will find a young donkey tied up, one that no one has ever ridden. I want you to untie it and bring it here. If someone should ask you, why are you untying it? Simply tell them, the Lord disciples went on as Jesus asked, and everything was just as he said it would be. Once they returned with the colt, they threw their coats on top. Jesus climbed up and rode the donkey with his disciples into Jerusalem. People began to notice as Jesus was traveling down the road, and some would throw their coats onto the so the donkey wouldn't have to walk on the dirt. This is a great sign of love and respect for Jesus. At one point, a whole crowd of disciples was gathered together, and they began to praise God with joy. In loud voices, they praised Him for the miracles they had seen and said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. May there be peace and glory in the highest heaven. All of this was upset to the leaders and the Pharisees. And they said to Jesus, This is it. Tell your disciples to stop. Jesus answered them, If I were to ask them to be quiet, the stones themselves would cry out instead. Crowds that day were singing with all creation already knew. Jesus is the King of Kings, and nothing will ever change that. Nothing. Jesus is King. One of my favorite slides in the Bible is, if the people stop praising, the rocks will cry out. And it's, it's a very powerful, powerful statement, just recognizing that Jesus isn't just for, for people. Jesus is, all, is about all of creation, including people. Let us pray. Lord, as we come on this Palm Sunday, as we come remembering your entry into Jerusalem and all that that entails, the excitement, the joy, the 
tragedy and sorrow. The renewed hope and the realization of our faith being brought alive, in some cases truly for the first time. Lord, as we journey through Holy Week this week, help us to remember that you are King, that you are Lord over all of creation. Lord, help us to trust in you and to not be afraid. To not be afraid of the things that will trouble us this week. But help us to trust that we are loved, that we are care, cared for, that we are important in your eyes and we will never be forgotten. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty. Let us come here for the Lord in prayer once again. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for the sun that shines and reminds us of the warmth of your love. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather here freely, to not be afraid of persecution, to not be afraid of what others will think, but to know that we gather in your holy name with the freedom to come and to go. And Lord, as we gather here today, we thank you for, for friends, for family. Lord, we thank you for, for the hope that you have placed in us, that you have shown to be true through Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit, and through your Holy Word. Lord, as we come today, we pray for, for those who are grieving, for those who are grieving the death of loved ones, for those who are grieving the life that was, but will not be, grieving the changes in health that will forever dictate how life will be lived. Lord, help us. Help us to help those who are struggling today. Those who are struggling with health problems and trying to figure out exactly what is wrong. Lord, we pray for the families that are trying to lift up and encourage, for the people that are dealing with diagnoses of cancer, heart problems, dealing with the constant running back and forth for dialysis or treatments, the uncertainties that too often live in our hearts and our minds because we don't know everything. We don't know what today will bring or tomorrow, but we live each day trusting in you. And Lord, we come into your midst, some with great energy, being able to do wondrous feats, some just getting by, unsure of their heart, unsure of their mind, but seeking peace, seeking restoration, seeking a renewed hope. And some come with tiredness, weariness, with anxiety that weighs them down, hurt in the heart and in the mind. And some come with loneliness that seems to be unending, 
and they are looking for a place, a place to belong, to feel welcome. Lord, we all come with different needs, with different realities in our lives. Lord, surround us with your Holy Spirit and guide us. Help us, Lord, to be one body, to see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and to see those on the streets, those we might know and those we don't, as people who carry your image. Let us live with humility and respect. Lord, as we think about the struggles around the world, whether Haiti, El Salvador, or Nicaragua, whether it is in the Middle East, whether it's in Ukraine, or the tension that is felt in Taiwan, or the uncertainty of the people in North Korea, the fear of what world powers might do that affects the littlest child. Lord, have mercy on us. Help us, Lord, to live in peace. Help us, Lord, to hear each other, to not seek domination, to seek freedom and grace, not to seek destruction, but to seek light, excuse me, life. Lord, help us to truly live as your people, renewed and saved by Jesus Christ, empowered by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we turn to your word once again, guide us in its reading, that we might be filled with grace, with love, with peace that we might remember the praises that were shouted out so long ago, that as we too look for the Messiah to come, our King, our Lord, our Savior. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Luke Chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an excuse me, embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you.
When we think about the, the term, the rocks cry out, we think, and we hear it, and we think that it's an impossibility. And yet, over and over again, there is this interesting uh, field of study called archaeology, which does a whole lot of digging, sometimes into rocks. And it's amazing how, when we, we hear some of the stories in the scriptures that people have, have relegated to that of myth, of fiction. And yet, when the rocks cry out, it brings a validity, a truth, that was once missed. Jesus uses this term to accentuate and to, and to bring an exclamation to the praises that the people around him are giving. He is using it to say to the Pharisees, that you can't stop this. How many of you like to control things? <laughs> it's interesting because we, there are many things that we do try to control. And yet, Jesus is saying, this is not something that is easily stopped. That is not just about the praise of the people, but it's the praise of all of creation. Now here's the question that I have for us. When we think about how easy it can be to praise God in a place like this, where we're pretty sure that what's, what the person next to us will think. And yet, when it is outside of these walls, for some reason it seems a little bit harder. How often have we even put in a position where we struggle to praise God. Maybe it is being around other people who, who also have different thoughts about what praising God looks like. Or maybe we are afraid to offend because there are many different beliefs out there. Maybe we are trying to protect others from feeling uncomfortable because there has been struggles. Maybe we are also struggling with our faith. Maybe we are afraid because we're afraid of what other people will say about us. And yet, and when we see Jesus riding in to Jerusalem on the young colt, we see people praising, crying out, shouting out, and it is amazing the fearlessness that they have. And yet it seems that as we come on a Palm Sunday like this, in a different time, in a different place, many of us struggle to praise God. It's interesting when we think about Palm Sunday, we think about Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. And yet, uh, when we look at this one, uh, because I can't exactly read the Hebrew, but the Hebrew is there, Hoshia, the Greek is Hosanna, Hosanna. Uh, I can read Greek somewhat. Uh, Hosanna is actually not found in the Gospel of Luke. It is found in the Gospel of, of Matthew, Mark, and John. Um, the Synoptic Gospels, which are, usually, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all tell a very, very similar uh, accounts of Jesus' life. Uh, John uh, gives a little bit more depth to, to, the, to the story of, uh, of Jesus' life. Um, you can, Matthew, Mark, Luke uh, have a very similar order. Uh, some of the content of John is slightly different and has a different focus. Um, all, all of them are telling the good news of Jesus Christ. All of them are telling of Jesus' ministry, but each of them is written to a different audience. Um, Mark is believed to be the, the first gospel. Uh, Matthew uh, and Luke may or may not have been based off of uh, Mark. Uh, Luke, 
uh, Rakes straight out says that he is writing an account of the stories that he has heard of the gospel of, or of Jesus' life. Uh, John uh, is believed to be uh, one of the disciples who wrote it uh, later on. Um, Mark is believed to be a, uh, uh, was telling the, the gospel as according to Peter. Uh, Matthew is being written to a Jewish audience. And you see a lot of the, the uh, Old Testament references coming in, especially in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, John's main focus is on the miracles. You see uh, a lot of parables being told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So just a little bit of a, uh, sort of history, literary light, uh, lesson on the Gospels. But in spe specifically in this instance, uh, Hosanna, one of the words that we, we, uh, we associate with Palm Sunday is actually not in this, in this uh, section of Scripture. What we do have, the people are shouting out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is, this is important because as we think about this, as we think about who Jesus and what Jesus represents to the people that are along the road as he's coming in to Jerusalem. Uh, if we, we miss this little point, uh, that we're missing a whole bunch of what happens in the next week. So as you have the people cheering on, uh, the people along the road are declaring that Jesus is king. Anybody see as this being a problem? They are not just saying that he is Messiah. They are cheering on Jesus as king. Um, this, is, this is important because when we get, come to Good Friday, one of the criticisms, and they actually the only way he's crucified, is as, a, as someone who is seen as uh, challenging Caesar. Pilate, we come to Good Friday, Pilate finds no basis for this whatsoever, but still allows him to be crucified. Um, so this is an important aspect to remember. Uh, it's, some, it's, some, it's sometimes what reminiscent of King David bringing into Jerusalem uh, the tabernacle. Uh, and he's dancing, in, or bringing in the Ten Commandments into Jerusalem. And he's dancing. There's a great parade. Uh, you can find this in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 6, verses 12 to 15. You can, it's also reminiscent of what is uh, reported in uh, Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, uh, that the king coming home in victory from a, uh, from a battle. Uh, you see the, the riding in on the, the colt coming in peace, coming in humility. It is a king in the form of, not of, of a, as an oppressor, but as someone who is loved, someone who cares for his people. So when we look at, at the, the different aspects of what's happening here on Palm Sunday, as, we, as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, uh, it is also reminiscent of how some people, they wanted to get a whole crowd going. If you get enough people saying it, it must be true, right? So that you have people cheering that Jesus is king. That you have the hope of the, the nation that is, a, that is tired of the oppression of, uh, of an occupying country. Of not having the freedom to be their own country. And yet, there is different, if we look back in history, there is different accounts of how oppressive the Roman rule was. Yes, there was higher taxes. But in some instances, the nation of, of Judah and Israel actually had, uh, a, they had a few concessions made by the Roman government that made it a little bit less oppressive than other countries. So we have in the image of Jesus coming in, an image of a king riding in humility, riding, caring for his people. We also have the if we were looking at this along the lines of David bringing the, the uh, Ten Commandments into Jerusalem, you have that religious 
aspect coming in. You have that faith aspect coming in. And you have it all tied together in one person, a Jesus. That he is coming in with the message of God, with the law of God, coming into Jerusalem. It is the image of of a spiritual leader, but also of a political leader. So you have this all tied together in one person that is coming together, bringing hope. Bringing hope not just for freedom, but is bringing hope that God is on their side. And when we think back to when the Israelites went into battle in the early days, when they had the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant would go first. And they believed that God was fighting for them. This, and Jesus coming in, the people are not just seeing a person. They're seeing God's love and God's power being pulled together in a political and spiritual person that is going to bring freedom from the Roman occupation, that is going to bring hope Because he is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, who is going to do great and wonderful things. He is bringing salvation, salvation in a spiritual sense, salvation in a a political sense. And this is creating a lightning rod, not just for the people that are cheering, because they're excited, they're electrified. But also for those people that are saying, shh, or someone might hear you. Because if someone over there hears you, this whole thing, this peace that we're living with, we don't like this peace, but it's peace. We're working with it. It's going to blow up and we're all going to lose. There's people on the road are feeling they've already lost. But Jesus is bringing hope that they might win. The people in authority, especially when you look at Uh, at some of the different uh, groups. The Pharisees were very much on the uh, religious righteousness. The Sadducees were more of a political group. They had property. They had stuff to lose. When When you have people that have stuff to lose, they're afraid to lose it. The Pharisees were trying to make sure They were the ones that knew the scripture inside and out. They're the ones that would debate with Jesus. They're also some of the ones that actually agreed with Jesus. We don't always hear that. But some of them did. So with Jesus riding in with a sign of a king, with the people cheering that he is king, they are, this is a, an electric event, and we wonder how we get from Easter Sun, or uh, excuse me, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, to Monday, Thursday, where he's arrested, to Good Friday, where he's crucified. The reality is, there's a lot of people in Jerusalem, and not everyone agrees. The people were excited because multiple promises were being realized in Jesus. The promise of the Messiah, the promise of the restoration of their kingdom. And this is, as we think, they're thinking in a political sense. And yet Jesus, and this is telling, especially when we get to the trial uh, before Pilate, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm not challenging Caesar here, per se. Kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. A kingdom that aligns people's hearts, minds, bodies, and souls. A kingdom that will look beyond the political figure because the political figure only has power if God gives them power. That power can be taken away, as Jesus mentioned to Pilate. 
It is a kingdom that is not rooted in stuff, but is tied together with all of creation. The people were looking towards the earthly kingdom, but Jesus was looking at restoring the spiritual well-being while also living in the physical world. Not destroying the physical world, but bringing healing to the physical world, bringing healing to the people, bringing healing to societies. This is not just a simple, I'm going to be more powerful than you. I've got bigger guns than you. This is Jesus saying, we're going to change what is happening here, because what is happening here isn't working. All it is doing is bringing more death and more destruction. I will come with humility, not with pride. I will come with hope and love, not with hate and oppression. I will come because the whole world is hurting. Too often when we think about the redemption that Christ brings, we focus on ourselves. We focus on those like us. And yet, when we think about what Jesus is saying here, what Jesus is doing, the praising of, of this, of the Messiah, the anointed one of God, of, of what could be a political figure, a political uprising. And yet, the Pharisees are saying, Jesus, you've got to get these people to be quiet. This is sounding blasphemous all of a sudden. And Jesus is saying, this isn't blasphemous. Because this isn't just about you. It's not just about them either. It's about all of creation. It is about the healing that needs to take place in all of creation, in all of our hearts. A healing that is going to happen that even if they are quiet, then all of creation will cry out and praise. Because this isn't just about you. It's not just about them. It's about the brokenness that is living in the world around us. This is something that in the busyness of our lives and the stresses, the problems that we face, the health problems, the economic problems, the supply shortages, the cost of living, the things that break down that don't last as long as they used to, including ourselves. In the face of all of this, are we excited enough about what Jesus has done? We have the beauty of looking back and seeing the hindsight. Now the people that were cheering on, they had seen firsthand in many cases. They had heard the excitement, that excitement was palatable. But are we, do we struggle to have that same excitement? To think about what Jesus has done and see how Jesus has affected the world around us? Or do we only see how people have manipulated the good news of Jesus for their own benefit? And we struggle to make sense of that. Do we see the abuses that have been done in the name of Jesus Christ? And that's all we know about. Or do we recognize the good, the love, the grace, the hope that Jesus has shown, not just as he rode into Jerusalem, but as he gave to the disciples to share amongst all nations the hope and the love that he gave to each of us to share wherever we go. Have we had the eyes to see and the ears to hear what Jesus is doing in our own lives? 
Or are we, at times, tired? Kind of like my daughter has these nice little night lights. You press a button and they go on. Except when the battery's dead. Do we need to come to Jesus and be recharged? To experience that joy, that love, that grace, that wholeness of life that he has promised. And when we think about the, the joy that is happening as Jesus rides in, the people are excited once again. They have a reason to be excited. We have a reason to be excited about Jesus. We have a reason to be excited about his love and his grace and the hope that he has given to us, the peace that he has invited us into. That it's not about the fight, it's not about all the things that we we try to make faith so complicated about. It is about the relationship of our Messiah who came to his people to love them, to bring new life, new hope, so that they would walk with him as he leads each of us into the fullness of life. There is a song I used to sing in university. It's called, Ain't No Rock Gonna Cry in My Place. It goes on, there's a whole lot of other verses for it, but the gist of it is, Ain't no rock gonna cry in my place As long as I'm alive I'll glorify his holy name Ain't no rock gonna cry in my place as long as I'm alive I'll glorify his holy name praise his holy name as long as I'm alive I'll glorify his holy name praise his holy name as long as I'm alive I'll glorify his holy name does the creation around us have to praise because we're too tired Do we need to be recharged and allow our voice to join in in that praise? To join in in the praise that God has for us, has given to us, the praise and the hope that God has instilled in us, that he's given to us through his holy word, through his holy spirit, through family, through friends, through a community of faith. Remember, The gift of Christ is not just for one, it is for all people, it is for all of creation. Amen. I invite us to join together as we sing, Christ for the world we sing. Please stand.
Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to, to praise. Help us to sing the glories of Jesus Christ. Help us to share the good news of all that Christ has done and who Christ is that we would not be afraid of what others would, would think, but would lovingly give the gift that has been given to us. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us to stand as we sing the doxology. blessing of praise, offerings and tithes, and works that have been done through the strength that you have blessed us with. Grant us, Lord, your blessing, your blessing to continue to serve you in the weeks, months, and years ahead. And Lord, we pray that you would bless the, the tithes and the offerings and the works of service, that they would be used to share your good news the good news of forgiveness, the good news of love, the good news of grace, the good news of hope and peace. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go today, may we listen to the Lord speaking to us. Be guided by his word this day and every day. Let us go in peace.
May we go today walking in the authority that God has given us through Jesus Christ to share the good news, to bring hope, to bring love and grace, to share all that Christ has given to us, to allow others to live in the fullness of his peace. May we go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Until we meet again, may it be at peace with God, with each other, and with yourselves.